Well, good evening and welcome to Off Planet Radio Live. I'm Randy Moggins and we are huh, seven minutes late starting tonight. Sorry, I had to reset streaming server and I lost my monitoring system, which meant I couldn't hear myself and I couldn't hear anybody else either. If you go away for two weeks and cobwebs grow up all over the place, good evening, hello, welcome back after a two-week break. We are back on Off Planet Radio Live and uh, great guest tonight. Um, we'll bring him up in a few minutes here. Uh, business orders. We took a two-week break to basically um, breathe, catch up on some new material, redo some things. We have um, uh, enormous obstacles in our way these days, and one of them being our websites. And uh, <clears throat> so there's going to be a new website coming for offplanetradio.com. That site may go down at some point for a few days. And uh, that will be to bring a new website up. We're having, um, well, malicious interference, I guess you would call it. And uh, we need to deal with that. We've got a very interesting period of time coming up here. What we've been doing is taking um, two-week breaks on a quarterly basis. That gives me some time to uh, rest, reconfigure, catch up on material. I'm pleased to announce that Chris Holly is joining me on Off Planet Radio. She is going to be a regular co-host on uh, at least two shows a month. And uh, Chris comes to us with a huge amount of experience in reporting in the paranormal. We just finalized today the details and she will be here twice a month bringing to the table enormous amount of experience, journalistic integrity, and uh, some guests that I believe will be unique to the kind of work that we've been doing. The planet we live on is a labyrinth in terms of understanding the reality, so-called, that we live in. And uh, I, I was actually here on Monday when um, the horrible bomb attacks occurred in Boston. I don't watch TV as a general rule. I happened, and there are no, no, there are no coincidences, I happened to turn the TV on shortly after the incident in Boston, and I got to watch a little bit of it live. Um, the anomalies are already beginning to show up. Was this a terrorist attack? Was it a false flag event? It has a different feel than some of the events we've seen in the past. And um, one of the anomalies that I note is that um, the Boston Globe had put a, uh, a tweet, a tweet do you, what do you call that, a tweet, that's Twitter, they put a Twitter post out indicating that the uh, Boston Police Bomb Squad was doing a live drill the same day as the Boston Marathon, which I find incredibly bizarre. So people have noted the presence of uh, bomb squads and police sniff sniffing dogs before the event and the fact that there is a predated, pre-timed uh, Twitter post from the Boston Globe indicating this was so. We'll watch and see. We'll see how this plays out. Again, the reality streams in many directions and uh, we just look at the details and we try and parse it out. And so it is with the world of paranormal, the world of UFOs, um, trying to understand the nature of what we're dealing with, the uh, <laughs> nature of the beast, so to speak. And uh, my guest tonight brings to the table a very rich background in terms of his own investigations into what I guess we'll just call the paranormal experience. He has a background as an art director. He is the publisher of IntrepidMag.com, and uh, he is a graphic, art, graphic artist as well as a researcher and author. And so my guest kind of, I should also mention, has a theological background, as do I. So isn't it interesting how the labyrinth winds us in paths and we wind up um, many times on the same road with fellow journeymen. My guest tonight is Scott Allen Roberts. Scotty, welcome to Off Planet Radio Live. Hey, Randy. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's wonderful to hear your voice tonight. Sorry for the delay. Um, hey, it's all right. 
tech problems do occur, and uh, it's not like I've got five network technicians working around the clock to keep this thing up. It's um, right. duct tape. And we used to call that uh, we used to call that scintillating live radio. Oh, it is. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's it's just you know um, the adrenaline flows because you're you're constantly solving problems and dealing with the. Uh, uh, the limitations of technology and sometimes your own human uh, understanding. Scott, I, and I guess I call you Scotty, is that what you go by? Yes, everybody's called me that for years, so. Okay. I don't know where it really started, but that, there it is. <laughs> I, uh, I found your, um, your background interesting. Um, Tell us a little bit about your background, uh, where you've been, what you've done, how you embarked on this journey with Intrepid Magazine and some of the conferences that you're doing and the various projects. Well, okay. Um, yeah, my, my background is, uh, is a little diverse. Uh, I've been into lots of different things, uh, but they all seem to take on a, a certain, uh, oh, um, how would you call it, a certain synchronicity after mm-hmm, a while. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, I started off in, in seminary in my adult years and uh, Bible college seminary. I uh, had some questions with things and, and it, it ended up eventually driving me out of the church altogether. Not necessarily out of the faith, if you will, but uh, even that, that hangs by a thread some days, I think, and that's probably by my own design. Um, but uh, I spent most of my adult life in uh, advertising and uh, um, alongside of that did many other things. Um, I've got uh, more recent history. I've got uh, a couple of books out. I've got uh, uh, The Rollicking Adventures of Tam O'Hare, which is a fictional tale. And I, I authored and illustrated that book. You could, uh, if you're interested, you can see that at tamohare.com, T-A-M-O-H-A-R-E.com. It's just set in the 15th century, uh, I'm sorry, 16th century, uh, between the, the conflict between Mary, Queen of Scots, and Elizabeth I as a back setting. And uh, the main character is a uh, Irish lord. Um, and uh, it's all about honor. It's all of the, the book about honor, about teaching honor, passing honor on uh, nobility of the real sort. And I, I tell the tale with animals. It's a story I used to tell my little girl when we were small, and, and uh, then I wrote it into a book form and illustrated it. But that's my first book. I've got The Rise and Fall of the Nephilim, which is one of the things that I questioned from my seminary days and onward. And uh, I finally wrote a book about that. Uh, that came out last year about this time. And uh, following that up with the, uh, the Secret History of the Reptilians, which is out now. And uh, I am two weeks out as of today uh, with my publisher, New Page Books, on a third book, which I am uh, authoring with a good friend of mine, Dr. John Ward, who is a uh, British archaeologist living in Luxor, Egypt, uh, for the last uh, dozen or so years. And uh, he and I have written a book on uh, Moses and the Exodus called The Exodus Reality, unearthing the historical Moses, identifying the pharaohs, and examining the Exodus uh, from Egypt from a very historical vantage point, not a biblical one, although uh, it's, it's researching a biblical mystery, if you will. So that's what I've been into lately. Uh, I used to do some radio, uh, did political radio, did some paranormal radio, and uh, uh, gave that off about two years ago when I launched Intrepid Magazine. And uh, prior to that, I was with uh, uh, the Ghost Hunters uh, official magazine, Taps Paramag. I was the editor-in-chief there for about a year and a half. And uh, Intrepid, I kind of picked up the reins where with things I couldn't do at Taps, and I always like to say Intrepid Mag is really the stuff I like. It's the stuff I want to do. Uh, it, it, in a sense, you know, I'm kind of, it's kind of, you know, we're a small operation, but I can go, hey, I'm in charge, so I can publish whatever I want to publish. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and so I, I get all kinds of writers, all kinds of contributors in. And we cover everything from politics to science to the fringe elements of both of those uh, into the alternative thinking, into metaphysics, into ufology, uh, ancient aliens or paleo contact as uh, we like to call it around here to give it a more hoity-toity name 
uh, than a television show. My goodness, and, you've uh, been hanging out with Micah Hanks too long. That was no. Oh, <laughs> yes, Micah Hanks is my partner. I, in I, these yes, I came to understand that when I, when we had Michael on the show last month. That was I did not know that at the time that I booked him yeah. and booked you. Very he, he is uh, he's an amazing friend of mine, uh, an amazing thinker, a critical thinker. Um, uh, I hate to just plug him in any in in any one slot because he is all over the board. Micah is the kind of man who I can say to him, "Hey, Micah, have you ever tried uh, have you ever tried cheesecake?" And his response would be, "You know, I was talking once to uh, the late Doctor uh, So and So about cheesecake and where the best uh, cheesecake comes from—the <laughs> flour that is, of course, made in the over the Grand Meridian." And if you look at your maps and you compare that to ancient cosmological charts, you will find that. And he will go on and on. And then at the end, I'll say, so do you like cheesecake? He goes, I think I just said that. And so, you know, I like to call him Spock some days because that's <laughs> the way he is. And, uh, um, but Mike is a good man. I love him to death. And by the way, it is his 30th birthday today. So I just want to say Whoa, happy birthday. Whoa, happy birthday. A big 302. Happy birthday, Mike. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. And uh, he and I have also started the Paradigm Symposium together which uh, is a branch off of uh, Intrepid Magazine. And last year, we had Paradigm Symposium, and we, uh, we stepped out on a limb with it, and I said, I want to have something that's a little headier than all the paranormal types of events I had seen out there and something that appeals to a bigger audience or a more an audience that I would think has more invested in the intellectual side of things and wanting to know things as opposed to going out and ghost hunting and things like that. And uh, so we invited Eric Von Daniken, and he came, and all the guys from, from Ancient Aliens, Giorgio Sukulis, Phil Coppins. Um, uh, Bill Burns was supposed to be there, and he had to uh, resign himself from about a week ahead of time. Um, we had uh, George Norrie. Um, the whole uh, Prometheus Entertainment crew came out and filmed there. As a matter of fact, uh, April 5th, Friday, what was that, a week ago, Friday, uh, they aired their Von Daniken legacy episode on Ancient Aliens, and it was all in the backdrop of the of the Paradigm Symposium this last October, uh, which was very cool to see. And uh, so we had all these people there, and uh, it was a, a success in the sense that uh, um, everybody who was there felt that there was a reason to be there, that they learned something. There was such a great spirit, a great attitude there. And so we uh, went from there, and we, we have uh, redeveloped uh, Paradigm for this year. And you can go to ParadigmSymposium.com and see the guests that are coming this year. We've got Scott Walter from H2's uh, America on Earth, uh, Robert Baval, Egyptologist. You've seen him on Ancient Aliens and all sorts of shows on the History Channel. Uh, in Egypt, uh, we've got uh, L.A. Marzuli, Dr. Robert Schock, um, Kathleen McGowan, uh, and the list just goes on and on. You can go over and take a look. We've got about 20 speakers coming this year. So this is what we do. This is uh, this is the stuff we are actively involved in. And if you uh, if you want to see uh, what we're all about, just go to intrepidmag.com, and you can take a peek at what we're all about. I'm happy to say I was a charter subscriber to Intrepid Mag, so I've been enjoying it for oh, fantastic. A, uh, a long time here now. Um, I want to. We have some interesting intersections. I don't know what that noise is. We got a phone noise coming hmm. up on the line. Anyway, we'll hopefully somebody will squelch that. Um, you and I have an interesting kind of background in terms of both being kind of theological trained and um, both of us growing up in what I'll call kind of a churched environment um, I couldn't get my questions answered and it, in the 90s when I was going through a, a series of churches which led to my, me ultimately going to Bible school and then ultimately exiting the church much like yourself I remember um, a pastor who was mentoring me at the time, I asked him about Genesis 6. And it was the most frustrating thing I ever encountered because he looked at me and he laughed and he said, oh, we don't know what that is. We don't talk about that. 
And I'm like, <laughs> you're, you're, this is a Baptist minister. And I'm like, wait a minute. You're supposed to be teaching the whole Bible. I mean, there are churches out there, they call themselves full gospel. This was a conversation that was not open for discussion in any church I ever went into. And for me, it was a very important issue. I have spent literally my entire life searching this out. So I'm wondering, did you encounter the same roadblocks that I did, Scotty? Oh man, you you are you sound like a mirror reflection. I remember when I asked the first time in seminary about the Nephilim, and it was linked to. I actually had two questions. Um, the first was about the Nephilim. Who are these guys? And it was my question: Who are they? And uh, my other question was: They were linked to the, the the sons of God. It says in Genesis six, the sons of God came down and impregnated human women, mm -hmm. and. Uh, mated with them and uh, uh, if you look to the Hebrew it calls them the Bene Ha Elohim uh, the sons of God the sons of Elohim and Elohim being that name for God used about 3,000 times in the Old Testament and Elohim meaning simply uh, El the name for God and Him the Hebrew suffix placed on a word to denote plurality and so the name used for God almost 3,000 times in the Old Testament was a plural term. Yes. Elohim. Yeah. And it meant God of or God among many gods. And, uh, of course, you know, we were taught the, the answers to these questions. I said, I said, who is Elohim? Uh, well, what does this mean that it's defined as a plurality? And what does it mean when it says plural, the sons of the God among many gods came down and impregnated human women? And, uh, uh, then I asked, of course, the Nephilim, who are these guys? Who are they? They're the descendants? Who are they? What does this mean? And uh, I was told, all right, you need to call them, call them. Yeah, don't be a troublemaker. Uh, you're a troublemaker for asking questions, obviously. I get the, uh, the serious, Roberts, you're a troublemaker. You know, you need to, you need to be quiet about this. Uh, this is what we believe. And the other, I was never shut up. I was just told, you're a troublemaker, so watch what you bring up. And the other was from seminary professors. I would get the, the wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We know exactly what you're talking about. You're a troublemaker. We'll talk about this over coffee someday when we're not here at the school. <laughs> and, uh, um, and what I was told was that, well, obviously, the sons of God don't refer to anything other than the sons, the human sons of the prophets who were aristocrats who built the school of the prophets up in the, up in the hills and they came they took this literally they came down into the valley in a sense sort of slumming amongst amongst the common people and took wives of whomever whoever they chose and i said that you're telling me is the interpretation of the bene ha elohim mating with human women this the daughters of adam and they said that's it and i said well now wait a minute and now now uh, Randy, if you came from the same background, you know what I'm going to be talking about. Oh, I know where you're going, and, and I want I, you to go there because this is an important conversation, I think. I was told in the circles where I was educated in my, my Bible training that the Bible is infallibly the Word of God from from uh, cover to cover, yep. even though it wasn't written as a cover to cover book. Exactly. Uh, and that uh, they always hailed back to that verse that says, not one jot or one tittle of this to uh, Hebrew punctuation marks that are the tiniest punctuation marks, a word picture for meaning not any little tiny bit of God's word shall pass away and return empty. And uh, they applied that to all the Bible. And they said that words mean something they taught us. Uh, if you ever went to a Baptist church and heard a minister say, if I had a dime every time I heard this, I'd already be retired on a small Caribbean island that I owned. But they would say, open your Bibles to James 5, or James 3, 1. And it says here in the Greek, the original Greek, it says. Yeah. And if I heard, so or in the original Hebrew or in the original Aramaic. And so uh, the, the point I'm making by making a little mockery of it there is that every time I heard somebody speaking, uh, and in seminary we were taught that the original languages meant something, and that it was very vital to understanding the passage beyond just the English. And so, um, those original languages, when it says, the Bene Ha Elohim, 
intermingled with the daughters, and I can't remember the Hebrew word for daughters off the top of my head, but the daughters of Adam, meaning mankind, it's two distinct beings, Elohim and, and Adam, two distinct things. So I would ask my seminary professor, what does the, what does the contrast mean here? Why are the beings contrasted? Elohim versus Adam. And uh, that's where I was told you need to not question that so much. It's obviously the sons of God, meaning spiritual men, and you need to shut up now. And uh, that's literally the way those, those conversations would go. And uh, if we were taught that the language meant something, there was a stark contrast between the beings. Uh, if they were human men, I asked, why weren't they called the sons of Adam came down into the valley and intermingled with the daughters of Adam? I said, it's a contrast and it's there for something and you're wrong. And uh, uh, that wasn't looked on too brightly. And as I, as I moved along, uh, I was also told, by the way, that the, the Elohim, the reason it was a plural word was this is obviously the Trinity. <laughs> and I yes, said, okay, yes, yes. I, I get that. I heard I this said, one too. <laughs> I said, what do you do with the fact that when this was written, it was written supposedly by Moses, by tradition. I don't tend to doubt that at all. Um, I, I said, if it was written by Moses, um, who founded Judaism, I said, Judaism doesn't recognize a trinity. They don't have a trinity. How can this be the trinity? Well, God in his foreknowledge, you know, uh, obviously they're talking about God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, even though they didn't exist in those forms at that time. And it just became, I said, that takes more faith to believe that than it does to believe that just God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, and I said, that's ridiculous. It is a ridiculous argument. I said, that is a backwards argument trying to prove your case after the fact. And, and nobody liked that, of course. Nobody likes that kind of talk. And I said, I'm fairly convinced that it doesn't speak about the Trinity. It's not speaking about it. Some defined it. Uh, Elohim, because it's a plural word, also has a singular meaning. Yes. Elohim can mean, sing just like our word deer in the English language. I see a deer in my front yard, singular. I see a herd of deer in my backyard, plural. And they say Elohim is kind of the same way, depending on the context of the sentence you find it in. And uh, rabbinic scholars will tell you sometimes that Elohim means um, a, a singular God with multitude of majesty, a plurality of majesty and powers. And I get that. It's kind of like uh, hearing a, a Queen Elizabeth II say, you know, we are bestowing upon our people the steep cream, you know, on all the pluralities. Uh, it's, it's that plurality or multitude of, uh, of, of majesties. I get that. <laughs> But then what do you do with verses like in Psalm 82, where you come face to face with a group called the Divine Council? Yes. Yeah. And God, in the English, he's called God, but in the Hebrew, the word is Elohim. It says, and Elohim, singular, stood, singular, in the midst of the Elohim. Oh, 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 you can't stand in the midst of a singularity. It's a plurality. And he, singular, said to them, plural, you are all Elohim, plural, the bright shining princes of heaven. And so he's equating to himself by word definition, Elohim to Elohim, you are all Elohim, but I have some power over you. It's almost like Zeus was over the rest of the Olympians in the Greek pantheon of gods. And as I started looking at this closer and closer and closer, I started saying, wait a minute, I don't think the Hebrew Old Testament is teaching exactly what we think it's teaching. It's certainly Elohim is commanding his followers to view him as the single God. But it's also got many different places where it's talking about what looks like a pantheon of Elohim, for whom uh, the singular Elohim was had jurisdiction of some kind, or captaincy, if you will. And uh, um, I was very careful with this because I didn't know if I was committing blasphemy, if I was a heretic, <laughs> or what I was. And the, and the more I looked at this, uh, the more I became outcast with my old seminary friend. Uh, when I asked the questions, just asking the question could get me in trouble. Um, I actually had an old pastor friend of mine who um, 
uh, said something uh, very telling to me, and I wasn't ready for him to actually have said this, but this is what he said to me. He says, you might be right. I said, excuse me, did you say that? He said, yes, Scott. He says, look, at our church, he says, we've built a ministry here, and we and and what we teach about Christ and everything, he says, this all fits into what we're doing here with these people, and it works for them, and it's something we bring them. He says, you are talking about the deeper mysteries, he says, which we don't deal with at this church. He says, we deal with the superficial, if you will, the, the very basic. Jesus is God, Jesus Christ died for your sins, and he gives you redemption, and and these are the things we can do to help you. And they had a very strong, by the way, a very strong family ministry, rebuilding families, broken marriages, things like that. Unbelievable right. uh, ministry they had there to these people. But he came right out and said, these are things we don't deal with here. Um, not that we ignore them. He says, we don't have to deal with those here because we're focused in a different area. And he actually said to me, you want to try this, this church over here? It's called Solomon's Porch or something over at the U of M area. In, uh, the University of Minnesota area. He says, you gotta, you gotta go take a look at them if you're seeking. He says, they get into this stuff. He says, maybe you can go over there and, and mingle with them, try to find out. This was a couple of years ago when I was talking to him. And uh, it's interesting to me that all of this stuff that is the basis for some of the pop cultural ancient alien theories, the word Nephilim is so linked to the pop cultural side of ancient alienism, if you will, um, the, uh, the same with the Anunnaki and the Sumerian culture. These have become call words, almost, almost uh, uh, you know, the passwords to get into the club. Uh, are you an ancient enemy member? What's the password? Uh, Anunnaki. Oh, you're in. Now, and, uh, um, from, from my perspective, everything that you just said is kind of a snapshot of what I consider to be the Christian church today. And I've traveled through all of it. I went from mainstream to Baptist churches to a charismatic church. <clears throat> the problem is what you're writing about in your books and what we talk about on these shows goes back into the roots of ancient history. And if these bloodlines were tampered with in the way that they, we think they were, Houston's got a problem because it completely changes the entire message of what's in the Bible and the ultimately redemptive aspects of Jesus Christ himself. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think it does. It, it, all of this study has, real, has had immense ramifications on what I believe by faith. And uh, this is where I tell everybody who listens, look, I, I cannot tell you or dissuade you from believing what you believe by faith. Uh, you have to follow your, your hearts and your spirituality and what you believe God is saying to you. And uh, as for me, these are questions that have come up that have shaken the very core of certain things I believe. And if therefore God is not what I once believed he was, if he is something completely different, as you were just saying, in other words, what does that do to my belief in Jesus Christ? What does that do to the gospel for me? What does that do to Christianity? And for me, it has changed those things immensely. And uh, I got to tell you, there are times where I have avoided those things. I've had people ask me, well, you believe all this about God in the Old Testament. What do you believe about? What does that do to your belief in Jesus? And I just, it, I'm not going to go there. I can't go there right now. I'm, I'm dealing with this part of it right now. And, and, and literally, the, it, it put me through a crisis of faith. There were times where I would sit back and I would, in between the, the Nephilim and the Reptilian book, I remember sitting there and thinking about these things in my office, just kind of spinning in my chair and looking at the ceiling and, and going, God, throw me a bone here. <laughs> oh, I know. Listen, <laughs> I've been there. I, and, and I spent time where it's been in anguish over all of this because the fundamental questions are now completely skewing the original aspects of I think and we're talking here about faith we're talking about what we grew up believing and quite frankly our worldview and for me this was a huge shift in worldview because even as a kid I wanted to know about this stuff and I couldn't get answers nobody talked about this I mean 
uh, growing up in the 60s and the 70s, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have the resources that are now so richly available to us, Scotty, but um, there were questions on the ground about this and not being able to get answers from anyone except comic books, which actually proved to be a rich source of information oh, for me. Yeah. Um, sure. We, we now... I guess what I'm asking you is, did you imagine that you were going to wind up where you did dealing with things that are very much in the realm of the paranormal? In other words, dealing with the reptilians, dealing with the Nephilim, and stepping onto the, the stage of an arena which includes people who believe they are experiencers, abductees, contactees, and all of the things that go with this particular realm. You know, I uh, very honestly, in a sh- short answer is no. <laughs> uh, I never would have thought that, that I would be involved in any of this stuff. This is the stuff that, it always intrigued me. Uh, I would like to say that, uh, how would I put this? If you look at the way we looked at things when we were in ministry or in the church, you were called to be a minister. God had to call you. And when you went into church, you had to kind of, um, or into to seminary, you had to kind of put forward that that calling. God has called me into this, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. and it's usually people are drawn to that that have thought about those things since they were kids. That were the thinkers, the ones that wanted to serve God, the ones that did this. And, and as they grew into adulthood, they took this that way. Um, I think the opposite is true, or, or the same is it not the opposite? The same is true in a very same vein for people in in these other realms that you and I were were just talking about a second ago is that we've had these curiosities since we were kids and those curiosities mean something um those uh um the curiosity there were there was life out there somewhere else that there were uh uh monsters that there were whatever all the things that were our curiosities as our as kids those are the things that drew us into wanting to know more about it on an adult level as we gain better understanding how the world works and how fiction, mythology, and legend works. And when you start looking into those things, it starts making you question, if you will, in an anthropological way, it starts making you look at your faith and saying, what is different about my faith? What makes my faith a real thing compared to the people I might look at who claim, you know, uh, and an alien visits them every third Thursday of every month and uh, they have their evidence and they they thoroughly believe this and uh, I would look at that and say you're, you're kind of you're kind of tainted in the head I would say to these people you know because uh, show me some proof of this let me visit with you on a Thursday night let's find out let's see what's going on um, and the thing I'm trying to say here is that faith in a religion it's just like faith in ancient aliens, just like faith in evolutionary process, just like, which by the way is faith because it's still not proven. Absolutely, um, yeah. And I'm not a creationist saying that. I'm an evolutionist to a certain degree, but I, I think it's so, but I, I can't prove it, neither can science. Um, and, and so all these things, we, we look at all these things and we start questioning the roots of our own faith because our own faith really has no more substance than any of this other stuff. It's just more established. Uh, you know, I, I'll, I will have a uh, uh, somebody from the the church I would go to would would. Uh, oh, how can you be into the paranormal stuff? Psh, there's no ghosts. And I'm like, really? Are you sure of that? <laughs> yes, there's no ghosts. And you I, might want to read I, your well, own Bible, there, pal. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you do with the Holy Ghost? What do you do with uh, this and that and the other thing? This and that and this and that. And, uh, you know, the, it, it's so separated in their minds when they're really the same thing. And I hope I'm being clear on that. Um, yes. Uh, those are the things that uh, all of this stuff, I, it's, that's what the reptilian book is all about. It's about looking at religious legend that turned into religious mythology thousands of years ago. And, it, and in a sense, it's repeating itself now uh, into modern mythology. And these are the things that, I was on a radio show a couple of nights ago, and uh, one of the hosts from the station actually came in and wanted to take me to task because 
I had said there's no proof for me that the reptilians really exist. Now, I can make that statement and at the same time say, it doesn't mean I don't believe there's something to the theory and that there's lots of anecdotal evidences and things like that, but there is no definitive proof that they actually exist. And it's the same thing for God, you know? And, and so I made those statements. This guy came in and wanted to take me to task. And his whole evidence for backing up, and this is one of their other hosts, was, was the evidence that there's millions of pictures out there of political leaders with uh, vertical irises. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I, said, I said, look, I don't mean any disrespect, is it, but I've been a Photoshop artist That's since exactly 1989. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I said, I can spot a, a Photoshop image a mile away. I could reproduce. I said, you show me something I can't reproduce in five minutes, and, uh, and, and maybe I'll listen to you. And, uh, and this is the thing. All of this is still predicated on wanting to believe that something is so. And uh, isn't that what we have with, with Christian faith or Jewish faith? We, we believe that it is so, and therefore we operate on that. But our arguments all come from within the faith. Well, that was where I was kind of going with my monologue at the beginning of the show tonight, this labyrinth that we're kind of treading through. I mean, we have a faith in politics. We have a faith in our government. We have a faith in all of these institutions that we grew up trusting and believing were somehow taking care of us. And I think along the way... uh, (laughs) Uh, my faith got peeled back in layers and probably for me it was political but it's been every stratum of my understanding has been peeled back at some point and I've went wait a minute these people are lying to me they're deceiving me they're obscuring history they are not using honest science they're talking about empirical evidence they have no empirical evidence these are theories that have been trotted out much like Darwinism and you know this the book the reptilians you advance a very strong foundation of the history of this this isn't just about what is in the hebrew bible though is it scotty there's a deeper trough of background in history about what we call the reptilians there is there is a there is a deep history to what we call the reptilians and it uh, we find it, there are there are biblical stories that uh, that are very familiar to us. That is a base for some of the reptilian thinking, but those biblical stories go back to other cultures much further, and which we're also familiar with. If you're into any of this ancient alien talk at all, I uh, I, I, I kind of hinted at it a few minutes ago. Let's kind of start here with this. Uh, uh, if you look to one of the most familiar stories in Judeo-Christianity involving a serpent character, you're going to go to the Garden of Eden story. And you've got the serpent who, according to the story, tempts Eve uh, with a piece of fruit. And it's because the fruit was forbidden and she eats of it anyway and then gives it to Adam who is responsible for the woman and responsible for the whole human race that his disobedience to the mandate of God to not eat of that particular fruit is something that breaks down the relationship with God to irreparability and the need for a redeemer to redeem mankind. And not only just somebody who would step in as a redeemer, but the blood redemption. It had to be in the blood. There was always something with the blood. Yeah, yeah. And that interesting? (laughs) <laughs> and when the humans first fell, it was interesting that they were naked. That was the first sign that they were a fallen race. They realized they were naked, and they went and hid themselves. Now, there's something interesting about this whole passage that, that I have found, and some of it is speculative on my part, but I think very grounded speculation. And uh, um, let me build a little case for you here. First of all, I'll give you, I'll give you the pop quiz. Who have we were always? Who have we always been taught was the serpent in the garden? Satan, theoretically. Satan, right? Yeah. Uh, Lucifer, Satan, uh, the fallen Lucifer, the devil. But what's interesting is that the name Lucifer and Satan and the title Satan, the title of the devil, never appear anywhere in the in the Genesis passage, in the Garden of Eden passage. 
those words don't come up for over a thousand years later. They're attributed to the garden serpent. And even those references are a bit weak, that attribution to the serpent, to being Satan or Lucifer. They're almost word pictures or poetic, uh, um, um, poetic reference, as opposed to directly saying, and the serpent in the garden was... Uh, it was Lucifer. It doesn't say that. It doesn't ever do that. And uh, you go to the passage in the in the Garden of Eden story, and it talks about a character named Nakosh. Mm-hmm. And Nakosh was the serpent character. In the Hebrew tongue, the serpent was Nakosh. Now, Nakosh, by definition, meant, it meant trickster, it meant uh, the bringer of chaos, in other words, like a sleight of hand, sort of the chaos that, that happens after sleight of hand is revealed. Um, it talks about how uh, it has the, the, the meaning that uh, uh, it is an illuminator, um, a bringer of knowledge, a, uh, and, and the noun form, the kosh, meant the bright, the bright shining one. And there's a a version of that word, a derivation of that word, the nakashte, which is used by, created by Moses in the wilderness when he's got the children of Israel out and they're all complaining and God sends vipers to bite them all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And why does God send vipers? So they will all turn to him and look for healing. That always seemed like such a ridiculous thing to do, but I'm not gone, <laughs> so I can't question it. Um, oh yeah, you, you, uh, you want to talk against me? Snakes are going to bite you now. And then you know what you're going to have to do? You get to turn me to me to be healed. So there. And, you know, that almost sounds like a jealous... Uh, yeah, girlfriend. it's like extortion or something. It is. Um, but, so, uh, the Nakoshta was the bronze shining serpent that Moses cast and put up on the pole. And what people had to do was look to the serpent raised on the pole and they would be healed. Um, so Nakosh, the bright shining one. Um, he is the serpent in the garden, the serpent character. And uh, just as an aside, uh, I had mentioned Psalm 82, where God is speaking to the Elohim, the divine council, the pantheon of gods, if you will. And God says to them, you are the Elohim, the bright shining princes of heaven. There's the bright shining reference again. And then also when you have in Genesis 6, just before the preamble to the flood, the story of the sons of God coming down and impregnating human women, it was, it was the, uh, the, the sons, the, the Bene Ha Elohim, the sons of the Elohim, the Elohim that are mentioned in Psalm 82 is the bright shining ones. The bright shining one mentioned in the Garden of Eden story who has some sway over Eve, who comes and delivers knowledge to her. I believe these are all the same characters. The, the serpent in the garden, the, the Elohim that would descend in Genesis 6, and the divine council known as the Elohim, the bright shining princes of heaven, are all the same, one and same characters. They're all the same group of characters, the divine council. In a sense, Nakosh in the Garden of Eden is one of the Elohim descending and bringing knowledge to the humans. Now, here's what happens in that passage, remember? It says he, he tempts Eve, which is the same word, by the way, as seduced. He seduces Eve. All the verbs, the action verbs in the Hebrew, in that Garden of Eden interchange there, yeah, of the eating the forbidden fruit, they're all fairly neutral verbs, but they're also verbs that can be used in sexual context. I believe the whole story of the Garden of Eden is not one of eating forbidden fruit per se. It is an allegorical tale, an encoded message that speaks to sexual encounter, to race interrupted, to the human bloodline being interrupted by the serpentine bloodline, the Elohim, the character Nakash who is painted as a serpent in that passage. And she brings it to Adam, and Adam takes and eats of the same fruit. I think the sexual experience. And what happens to Eve? She conceives twin sons, Cain and Abel. Cain is the son of Nakosh. Abel is the son of Adam. And this is borne out all through what happens next. Uh, remember, um, 
God comes down because all of a sudden they're naked and God comes down you tell me how much this sounds like 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 a myth like, like mythological language it says and God came down and strolled through the garden in the cool of the day and he was looking for Adam and he called Adam and no answer and Adam he calls again and Adam says I'm here God says where are you he says I'm hiding and God says why are you hiding and Adam says because we were naked God said who told you you were naked and Adam said and then of course the blame game starts where Adam says well the woman you gave yeah, me was that woman gave me this <laughs> and then the woman is like you know and woman what do you have to say and well she's like the snake the serpent guy you know he gave me this and then God starts cursing them all and he says to the serpent he, he utters what is and you probably learned this in your own experience he uttered what is known to be in rabbinic circles in evangelical circles in Christian circles to be the first messianic prophecy in the Bible yes in Genesis 3 he says to the serpent and you will bite his heel but he will return and crush your head meaning uh, the, the whole meaning there was uh, that this is the prophecy of the come Messiah the one who the serpent would would try to destroy but whom would come back and, and crush him this is a, a messianic prophecy and then he says to them all he says and there will be constant enmity or conflict between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman and in other words the seed of the humans and uh, what he's laying out there is that there is a dual bloodline that has been created now what was the the term used in the jewish sensibility what became known as the term for the messiah it was the kinsman redeemer the one who would be one of us redeemer and all through the old testament you see this hammered away the messiah is going to come from the lineage of adam and he is going to be the one who is one of us the kinsman and uh, there were Jewish laws built around the kinsman redeemer as it applied to Jewish law. If a man died, his brother needed to come in and repay his debts and help his family. The kinsman redeemer. This was the picture of who the Messiah was supposed to be. And even when it got down to Jesus and this sect of Judaism called Christianity that accepted that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, they said that Jesus was one of, he was one of us. It was almost the watered down language of the kinsman redeemer, the one who would be one of us. You look at the genealogies that take place all through the Old Testament, especially the uh, books like the book of Numbers. Oh my gosh, it's uh, excruciating. You just go, why would I ever want to read this? (laughs) You're right. You know, you sit down and, you know, and, and, on Ashmahaz begot yeah, I know. Lamech. Did I have Lamech to memorize Lamech. this? Really? Yeah. yeah. And it goes on for 13 chapters in Chronicles of this straight. But what are they doing? What was the efficacy of those passages? Why were those considered to be the Word of God? It's because it's, a, it's laying out the lineage of the Hebrews that would lead to the birth of the Messiah. They had to have a record of this. This is why the firstborn was so important. This is why it was so important to recite the genealogies, because they were reciting the line of the Messiah. And the line of the Messiah had to be proven to become come from pure human blood. So if and when that Messiah was born, they could say his father was was it was was Lamech and Lamech was his father and so on and all the way back to to Adam. Well, as it turns out, you, you even get up to King David. What do they do? They trace his lineage back from David to Noah uh, and then from Noah to Adam. But they don't trace through the firstborn son. The only, they, every one of those in the line is of the firstborn son of a family until you get all the way back to the beginning. They don't use Cain, the firstborn. Why not? Cain is the firstborn. And there's a chicken scratch through Abel. He's dead. He's got no descendants. And so Abel is it. And he's still, I'm sorry, Cain is it, and he's still alive. It said he went to the land of Nod and married a woman and built a city and named his city after his son. And that city is the same base word that is the, is the, is the word Iraq. He built the city of Enoch, which yes, linguistically yes. Is, is Uruk, which is linguistically is Iraq. And he, he bequeathed the Kenites were his descendants. Why didn't they go to Cain as the firstborn? Who did they go to? They went to the thirdborn, Seth. Yeah. 
Seth, yeah. I remember when, and it's almost bittersweet where Eve says, uh, after all is said and done and Cain is gone and Abel's dead, uh, it says, and, and Adam lay with his wife Eve and Eve conceived and God, and she bore a son and she says, God has given me a man child to replace my lost son, Abel. And uh, she doesn't mention that her lost son, Cain, is gone forever either. Just her lost son, Abel. Why is that? Because Cain is of the lineage of the Elohim. He is the one who was conceived by Nakash. He was not of pure human blood. He could not produce a line that could produce the kinsman redeemer. This is why it's important in Jewish, in Jewish theology that, that you recognize that Cain is not of pure human blood. This is why the lineage was not traced through him. Not because he murdered his brother. That didn't take away his position as a firstborn. What took away his position as a firstborn in the line of the Messiah is the fact he wasn't pure human. He was of the line of Nakash and Eve. And this is what happens when you look at the Old Testament and you find over and over and over and over again the line of the Messiah. He had to be of pure human blood. He had to be of humans. He had to be the kinsman redeemer, the one who was one, uh, one of us. And when this is said over and over and over again, what are they doing? They're obviating that the opposite exists. Uh, he had to be one of us. Why? Because there was something that wasn't one of us that he could have been. And, uh, and even when they get into after the birth of Jesus, the Christians, the, his followers, his disciples, trace the lineage of Mary and Joseph, his stepfather. The yeah, yeah, they trace yeah. them both. As, as distant cousins back to the line of David because oh what happened to the messianic line after the kingship of David they added a wrinkle to the messiah now not only has to be a pure, pure human blood he has to be of the line of David of the root of Jesse and so gee, they had to prove that Jesus, Jesus came from the line of King David which they did they traced Mary back to David then back to, Ad, uh, back to uh, Noah then back to Adam through Seth not king because and so the line of the messiah if you will the story or the necessity of a messiah in one sense if you look at this anthrop pure anthrop anthropologically the line of the messiah the story of the messiah in the hebrew text is one that is a story that is piggybacking the story of human interruption from the jewish perspective it's the hebrew version of of the tale of race interrupted and the story of the messiah is delineating the pure human bloodline versus that which was not and so uh, this is what's laid all through your old testament this is the, the beginnings at least in the judeo-christian sense of the serpentine bloodline entering into humanity not somewhere down the line but Man, crack way back at the get-go, at the very beginning. This, this wasn't like, oh, a few generations down, you know, one of my great-great-great-grandsons, says Adam, fooled around with somebody and interrupted the whole human race. No, it was his wife, Eve, the first woman. There's both, is, is the mother to all, it says. She was the mother of humanity, and she's also the mother of mixed humanity. It happened right at the get-go. And all of this, this is your beginning question with all of this that I've gone off on. The, the other is, is, is you go back to the Sumerian culture and you see a very identical story, a mirrored story that happened 2,000 years earlier. So um, the, the Hebrew accounting was written, I believe, by Moses. And I don't think there's any reason to doubt that. Uh, Moses was a real guy. And, and a matter of fact, that's our new book, John and I, writing about Moses. And uh, I believe he was a real man, and he would have written the things that you read in the book of Genesis in the, in the very late, if you will, or the lower number of 1400s, we were dating backwards in the BCs. So between the 14, between 1440 and uh, 1400 uh, is where Moses wrote these books. Now you go back to the Sumerian culture, which is 1,500 to 2,000 years earlier, and you've got some uncanny um, uh, similarities. And I believe what Moses did, he built a religion. He built Judaism on the basis of his Egyptian upbringing. Make no doubt, Moses was pure Egyptian. 
maybe Hebrew by blood, but he was pure Egyptian. And yeah, Randy. absolutely, absolutely, he was. Yeah, and this this and blows people's left, minds too. Yeah, yeah, and when he left Egypt, he was he married the the pag, the daughter of the pagan high priest of Midian, and I'm sure he heard all the religious stories of the Semites, yes. the Semitic cultures in Canaanite in the Sinaitic region. And he got all these stories of the of the of the Sumerian religions as well, and this is what he brought to the table when he wrote the Book of Genesis. And so, when you start seeing those, and and I'll take as much time as you want and go into that Sumerian culture because this builds the. Reptilian. Yeah, and actually, I would like you to do that. We're we're bumping up on an hour here, and I like to like to split things off so we have a, a nice, even, clean show. In the Sumerian culture, are we talking about uh, Enlil and Enki? Yes. Okay, this and goes into some good hint. stuff. Yes. I'll, I'll give you a quick hint before we break into the next hour, and that is that. That Elil, and the same name as, as Enlil, just like Jehovah and, and all the God names for God, uh, Elil is the same base word for El or Elohim, El Shaddai, El Elyon, it was carried over. And, and Enki, who was also known in the neighboring city of uh, uh, culture of the Akkadians, he was known as Ea. So Enki Ea, Ea is the same base word that was brought down into the Canaanite culture in the Hebrews, Yahweh. And Yahweh is the name for Jehovah. And uh, so all of this is carried over, and we'll, we'll talk about that more. Absolutely. And that's where we're going to take a break here at this part of the show. Uh, since we're, uh, we, ran, we ran late on that break, and it doesn't matter. We're streaming. We're our own network. We don't need permission to do this. But we're going to take a break at this point, uh, get a message in. Listen to a little music. We'll come back in about seven or eight minutes, and we're going to talk about the Sumerian parallel to the Old Testament story of the Shining Ones and what happened um, to bring us to this legend, this reality, I guess, of the reptilians in the present era. We'll do all that when we come back on the other side with my guest, Scott Allen Roberts. This is Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. We will be right back. Stress as never before. Environmental hazards, genetically modified foods, toxins in the earth and air, chemtrails, and escalating radiation levels. How do we get control? Thanks to the work of a team of researchers, we are pleased to announce a revolutionary natural technology that can help your body rebuild its original coating. RNA Drops is a complement formula based on the newly discovered iCell. RNA is the building block of DNA. These new DNA structures are the
the gateway to what is called ascension. Many users of the RNA drops have discovered the benefits of a product as unique as their own biology, finding newfound well-being, peace of mind, and a sense of control over their destiny. Like me, they are enjoying a sense of empowerment within their own bodies and emotions. To get all the details on RNA drops and to find out how you can obtain a free mini bottle, go to rnagenesis.com. That's rnagenesis.com. Back to hour number two of Off Planet Radio Live, April 17th, 2013. And next week, um, another very interesting show. Uh, we're going to have one of the UK's top paranormal investigators experts tony topping is going to be here and uh tony's an interesting character he's got a pretty deep background we're going to talk about paranormal espionage so that should be a very interesting show again tony topping will join us next week on the line with me now uh, for the second round, we're going to talk about um, Enki and Enlil and the Sumerian parallel legend of the serpent. I uh, welcome back for the second hour my guest, Scott Allen Roberts. Scott, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me back. Before we go any further, um, do I, I had a question. And I wanted to throw this by you. There is this whole thing around the flood of Noah. And one of the things that anybody that studied the Old Testament will notice is that that flood was theoretically, at least this was what we were told, designed to get rid of all of this, I guess you'd call it serpent seed that had infested the planet and to yes. once again cleanse the bloodlines. But interesting thing is, then we pop over to the Oh, book. yes. I I'm sorry. I thought you were going to go on there. Yeah, uh, so it, was that the point of the flood, first off? First question, in your understanding. Well, the, the, the flood was, uh, you know, when we were kids, we were taught in Sunday school, the flood, why did the flood happen? It was the wickedness of mankind, and that uh, God was going to wipe man off the planet. And uh, that's the way it got watered down to us. But if you go back to the story... Um, remember the story of the, uh, the, the Bene Elohim, the sons of God who come down and mingle with the daughters of men and have children. This is the object of the cleansing that the Nephilim had spread throughout all of mankind or known mankind at that time. Mm -hmm. And that God, and God says there was only one righteous man left is of course it actually the says that and i believe and i'm trying to remember the wording now because i'm, I'm rusty with my yeah. bible but it says he was pure in his generations is that what it was saying yes we were taught that we were told now that. that's coded no. language yes and and you don't notice it until you start taking note of the rest of this story and all the background to it. Because it says that Noah was a righteous man. And this is all we're taught, by the way, in Sunday school. He was a righteous man, and he was pure in all his generations. And we were taught that that meant he was a righteous man in all of his years from a line of righteous men. But this is not what the language says. The language 
says not, it doesn't call him righteous. It said he was a pure-blooded man, mm -hmm. and a pure-blooded mm -hmm. man who was pure-blooded in all his generation, in all of his, his ancestors, the genealogy that led to where he is now. Um, so this was saying that Noah was chosen because he was one of the very few left that was of a pure human bloodline. And the rest of them were of the tainted or the mixed bloodline of the Nephilim, of the Elohim. And they were going to be wiped out. Now, and if what's it, yeah, interesting ahead. is that just the passage itself even says, and the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. And so, that's uh, the part I wanted to get to, because we theoretically have the Earth, Earth cleanse, and Noah repopulates, and we go through history, history, cycle, history, we get to the Exodus, um, they cross the desert after 40 years of wandering around, I, I never understood that, it's like, what, a, a three-hour cruise, oh, that's Gilligan's Island, never mind, um, but they get <laughs> over, and in the book of Joshua, Joshua, all of a sudden they're flipping back again and it's like well but I thought they were wiped off the face of the earth but then again right. we're told they were there in those days and in the days after so the whole flushing thing kind of didn't work out too well did it Scotty no it didn't and now there are some people and I have to look at take a look at the linguistics of this I might be writing a follow-up to the Nephilim one of these days because I know it's interesting the way it's worded in the English and I thought and I was pretty clear that the Nephilim when people ask me who are the Nephilim I said they are the offspring they're the offspring of the mixing of the sons of God and human women but it does say in the English and I, I've got to go back and look this up again and look into the linguistics a little deeper because it seems and somebody had mentioned this theory to me it, it talks about the sons of God coming into the daughters of men and having children by them. And these children were the heroes of old and the men of renown. Mighty men of old, yeah. And, yeah. And then it says, and the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men and had children by them. That's the way I remember it, And in it the too. English, it yeah. almost sounds like wait a minute, are the Nephilim there, are they different than the offspring of the sons of God? Uh, that they were already on the planet and that they will and that they they survived the flood but the offspring of the Elohim did not uh, this is what I've got to look into and I want to look well into there's a deeper. there's a route back there in the book of Enoch if you look at it where Enoch mm -hmm. is told that these Elohim will see their children perish and yes. that's in the book of Enoch. But my, right. my, my question all along has been, if there were theoretically only Noah and his offspring in the, in the ark, we're, we're granting a huge amount of mythological breadth here. Right. Then right. how did we wind up generations later with, again, these, these um, giants in the land? And obviously you've got all kinds of tribes, all kinds of tribes named Ites, who apparently are offspring. Were the Neph yes. two, two questions. Are the Nephilim not the offspring of the union between the woman and the Nakash? Is that correct? Yes. The Nephilim are not themselves the Nakash, so therefore they're hybrids. No. Um, the Nephilim, I believe, and the way I've seen it thus far, um, from everything I researched, the Nephilim are the offspring of the intermingling between the sons of God, the Elohim, and the daughters, daughters of men. men. And uh, that Nakash was simply one of the Elohim. Um, and so in essence, Cain was the first Nephilim on the planet uh, in the human race because he was an offspring of an Elohim and a daughter of man. So it's um, looking like if we follow the narrative, and this is the part I wanted to ask you about, if we follow the narrative, we have the Nakash Eve incident, but then we have a separate citation where it says that the, the sons of God came down and mingled themselves with the daughter of men. It's starting to sound like, like a, a gang rape, rape almost. Uh, it does. Um, so we have like uh, repeated incidents of this. 
And my, my question to you, and you may not know this, but it's something I've pondered for a long time, and I don't have many people to talk to about this, was how did we get to where the children of Israel were crossing over, ready to take the land, and Joshua and uh, two of the other Israelites go over, and they come back, and they got these gigantic grapes, genetically modified grapes, and they're going like, there's giants all over the place. They're huge. And so they're back. It's like they never go away. It's like you can't get rid of them. Are they like, right. is this like extra dimensional seed or what do you think's happening there? Well, I, I, I don't think they were ever wiped out. I, I think that they survived the flood or they came back and continued to intermingle, at least in the Hebrew mythology. Mm -hmm. uh, because like you say, they have Joshua, he's ready to go in and take the land, he and Caleb. And uh, the other 10 spies who are there say, no, we can't go in there, the Nephilim are there. They actually say it. They say the Nephilim are there, the children of the sons of Anak. And Anak was one of the kings of yes. the Nephilim. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the same thing with Goliath, the whole David and Goliath story. They talk about Goliath, and I never knew this when I was in the seminary, I didn't know this. Goliath had three other brothers, and it says that they were all sons of the children of Anak, uh, of the Nephilim, and that David, in those in-between years, spent a lot of his time hunting down the other brothers of Goliath and killing them. And uh, he and his mighty men of, of valor. And so uh, there are several references of the Nephilim. The Nephilim were the kings that settled in the, in the valley the, or the, the, the cities of the plain. There were five cities of the plain and Sodom and Gomorrah were two of them that were mentioned that were destroyed uh, in the book of Genesis. But Sodom and Gomorrah were only two of five cities that were destroyed. Right. And we only know the names of those two, and it says that Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plains, and uh, this is down in that Dead Sea region. And uh, so, uh, and they were considered to be the tribes of the of the Nephilim. And so it's 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 really interesting stuff with no real conclusion, no real records to tell you anything other than what the biblical story tells you. This is all within the confines of the biblical story. Right, right. So, uh, again, if there's outside reference to this, it's not calling them the Nephilim or the Rephaim or the, or the Anakim, which are all uh, uh, these, these uh, races that sprouted off of the Nephilim, um, and all the children of Anak, all the children of the Nephilim. And uh, there's all these different uh, source points of them in the Old Testament. I think mean, the last you hear is very shortly after the time of David and Goliath. Um, there's a, some obscure reference of NFL and and, uh, and then they're just gone after that. Um, so uh, what's, what's interesting, though, to me, is that all of these stories, uh, these characters of the Garden of Eden story and all of this, have their source points, I think, in, in Sumerian culture. And they are blooded stories. It's a lot like, uh, I use this example, when Christianity went into uh, uh, Gaulish Europe and then up into the, uh, uh, the British Isles, um, they encountered and they wiped out the pagan religions there, the Druidic religions. And they took and burned down the oak groves and the groves and the right, high places right. of prayer and worship. But what did they do with those places? They built cathedrals there exactly. on those yeah. sites. Yeah. And they incorporated their religion. They incorporated their holidays. They incorporated some of their iconography into these chapels. And what's very interesting to me is that um, Christianity, which was supposed to be something new and different, really was incorporating the old. Uh, on top of what they brought to the table. And I think the same thing with Moses. When Moses created Judaism, because Judaism did not exist before the law, and when Moses set down the law, there was a Semitic religion that these people followed, but he laid down the law and he established the religion of Judaism. But there is so much filtered into Judaism from outside sources, it's unbelievable. 
Um, and as you and, even uh, pointed out, you know, we're going back now into Egypt, and then you have all these interesting images, these old uh, stellas and engravings that come out of Egypt that literally show these reptilian beings, that show these giants. And, and so yeah. we have overlaps within the cultures themselves coming out. The, the, the yeah. Hebrews coming out of Egypt, literally, but coming out of Egyptian culture, which already was seeded as well with these legends, as I understand it. Yes, uh, and, and it was. Uh, um, you go back to the Sumerian culture, which is where I believe Moses drew a lot of his information. Um, you've got, and we gave a hint of this at the, uh, yeah. at the end of your and last hour. this is hour. the segue, ta-da. Yes, and... Uh, uh, this is uh, um, where we talked about the chief gods of the, the Sumerians. Uh, their pantheon of gods were known as the Anunnaki, or the Anuna, or the Anu, and uh, these were all. Uh, the, the, this was the the like the Olympians were to the Greeks. Uh, this is who the Anunnaki were to the Sumerians, and it said that uh, Elil or Enlil, Elil, the same character that Elil um, was complaining to the rest of the gods one day about they're having to do their own work and they're tired of digging their own canals and planting their own uh, crops and tilling their own land and mining their own resources. And he calls upon Enki, his brother god, to say, create primeval man that he may do our work for us. And this is right in the, uh, I went to the, uh, a modern translation of the old ancient cuneiform texts. And this is this is what it said, and it used that language. Let us create primeval men to do our work for us, to to dig our ditches and, and our canals and and tend our crops and so on. And so uh, Enki is in charge of doing this, and he creates primeval men uh, with one of the goddesses. And uh, a while down the road, after humanity is well established, the king of of the humans at the time, it was a king named Atrahasis, and there is a tablets called the Tale of Atrahasis, and Atrahasis is the ruler in the city of Eridu, and Eridu is the remains of Eridu you can find today. Mm -hmm. um, Eridu is uh, um, in the backwaters of the Euphrates in what is current day Iraq, and uh, their patron god of the city of Eridu was Enki, Ia. And uh, he calls out to Enki and says, and it sounds like a very biblical passage, uh, he cries out with his hands up and he says, O Enki, uh, uh, o, the lo o Lord, hear our prayer and the supplication of thy servant, and uh, bend your ear to my words and hear my plight and my prayer. And uh, Enki hears Atrahasis and says, because of your faithfulness, I will come nigh to you, I will hear your words. And Atrahasis offers his complaint of being slaves, and slaves to the gods. <coughs> and Enki delivers to him the forbidden knowledge of the gods. He delivers to him the knowledge of how to rebel against the gods. And he comes down with his mighty men of valor and helps Atrahasis go to war against Elil and win the freedom of the humans. So in a sense, Enki became the first freedom fighter for the humans. And uh, as a result of this, Elil, in his rage, um, condemns Enki and the rest of his followers to the subterranean caverns of the earth to dwell forever in punishment. Now, take the this happened uh, in, in the Sumerian tablets. This was their cultural literature. Now, now, fast forward about 1,500 to 2,000 years, and you end up in, in around the time where Moses is writing about the book of Genesis, and he adopts some of this story. So, as I mentioned just before the break, Elil, in the migration of humans uh, from the Fertile Crescent down into the, into the Canaanite region, uh, the, and then the, the uh, migration of religion, Elil becomes known as El, the shortened version, in the Canaanite culture, and the Hebrews picked that up, and their name, their word for God is El. And uh, uh, El is the base word for Elohim, 
for El Shaddai, for El, Ad- El Elyon, these different names that you find for God in the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, what's interesting is that Enki, known as Yah, in this same migration, his, his name in the Canaanite culture, the Hebrew culture picks it up, it becomes, Yah becomes Yahweh, which is the word for Jehovah. And so, in essence, what you have is, is, is Elohim and Jehovah are two different beings, even in the Hebrew culture. They're not one and the same. And uh, uh, so, uh, um, what you've got here now is the establishment of the names down through history. Now go back again and look at the story in the Sumerian culture. And the story you've got... Uh, The gods creating primeval men to do their work for them, to till their ground for them, to mine their resources for them. Then you go into the Genesis story, and what does it say? God created Adam and Eve, or man and woman, and placed them in the garden to do what? By the sweat of your brow, you shall... Yes. Exactly. But he also said, the purpose was he placed the man and the woman in the garden to till the ground and keep it for him. And so this is just a slight variation on the theme. Uh, then so this is the, basically like God is a slaver. I mean, that's... It, just about. Yeah. And uh, uh, so you have to ask, which story came first? Well, the, the Sumerian story came first. The big question is, is it all prototype of a single religion that is underlying it all, that the stories are similar, or is it just what anthropologists will tell you? that each culture built upon the previous culture and added something to it. And, and it was equal around the earth. You had other cultures doing the same thing in the Far East. Um, uh, there's a little bit more on the Sumerian story uh, to, uh, to Hebrew. Um, you had um, Enki, Ea, dwelt in the underground ocean, the big underground, the Abzu, it was called. And he would come to the surface and he would ride his boat in the in the marshes around the city of Eridu, and it was known as the Serpent's Marsh because of the obvious presence of serpents there. And the Serpent's Marsh became known as the Serpent's Den, and eventually Ea, it became known as Ea's Den. And uh, Ea's Den became, uh, 2,000 years later, known as Eden. Ea then became Eden. <laughs> and wow. Eden was, of course, the, the garden. And so all of these things were cultural borrows. Um, You've got Enki then who rose up out of the serpent's marsh and delivered the forbidden knowledge and was condemned forever to the center of the earth, so to speak. Um, Then you have, in the the Judeo-Christianity, you have the serpent character coming and dispensing forbidden knowledge to the humans and being condemned to what they used to believe hell was at the center of the earth, to the subterranean caverns of the earth. He and his followers were cast down to the earth to dwell. And uh, so the similarities are are unbelievable when you start comparing them. And uh, at the same time, uh, you have um, this forbidden knowledge being delivered. Look at Genesis 3. What happens right after Adam and Eve eat the fruit and the fall of man comes and they're naked, what does it say? It says, it says God in the verse, but it's the word Elohim. Mm-hmm, it says, mm-hmm. and Elohim said, the humans have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and have become just like us, plural. Let us therefore prevent them from also eating of the tree of life lest they become immortal like us and uh, two big questions of mine I always knew that verse was there I always gloss over it and it occurred to me first you have this plurality going on it's the Elohim again speaking about us this divine council this pantheon of gods if you will first big question I had is what did Elohim or what did God have against his creation his humans gaining knowledge why was it forbidden to have knowledge and to grow the second question and knowledge that would make them like them uh, a lot like uh, or, or similar to or like unto the Elohim and secondly who was God really that the humans could become just like him 
and live forever just like him just by doing something by eating a forbidden fruit or gaining a forbidden knowledge there was something the humans could obviously do to become just like the gods knowing good and evil and then also to live forever just like them so the big questions I had was who were they really that that could happen so um, this is the story of Genesis compared to the story of the Sumerians and these are the two big serpentine accounts that have affected us from this point on. There's been a renewed interest in recent years, and I've noticed this, and it's because you can follow trends and data mine on the internet with the Anki Elil story. And I, I think it's because for a lot of people, they find it relatable in a mystical kind of way, whereas they feel kind of put off by the whole Bible thing, because with the Bible, we seem to have this resolution that occurs, whereas I, I think the Sumerian legend kind of is in suspense. There isn't really, at least not that I'm aware of, a savior figure per se. Is that is that true? That there's not a what? I'm sorry, I, I got a little distracted by it. You have exactly over there what I have here. Yeah, I got I a train, train coming. I got a train down here at the bottom of our hill, and it likes I, showing up in the middle of my show. <laughs> I have I have a train that is train tracks a block from my house, and they come whistling through here whenever I'm in an important conversation or on yeah. an interview. Yeah, we're actually, <laughs> and, and it's warm and the windows open, and that's probably why you're hearing it. Sorry about that. That's, oh no, that's that's, uh, that's okay. Yeah, this is our um, annual ten thirty evening train coming through. Gotcha. Uh, ours, ours like to come through at four in the morning. So. <laughs> well, we've got one of those too. Yeah, the, we're kind of here on the top of a hill, and they're down in the valley, so it echoes back up over the hill. Ah, uh, yes. What I was asking uh, you, Scotty, was, um, again, it feels like the Sumerian legend is kind of incomplete, whereas the Hebrew legend seems to resolve into the Messiah figure and the fulfillment of the Messiah. And a lot of people have become intrigued, I think, by the Sumerian legend because it, it, it's more open. It, and I notice a lot of people are looking more towards open spirituality. Is there a resolution in the Enki and LL? saga that leads us to what I guess we would loosely call kind of a redemptive aspect um, is there a redemptive aspect to the story um, Gnosticism current day Gnosticism is going to is going to have a different take on on the, uh, the Garden of Eden story mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in that it's going to tell you that the uh, the serpent there that there that there wasn't sin there that what the serpent did was deliver knowledge yes and that that knowledge was was a redeeming factor this is why um the the yahweh character is coming from jehovah really comes from uh um Iya or anki who was the one that was delivering the knowledge to free the human slaves now, this is, I got to tell you, religiously speaking, um, this is either all exactly like it sounds, or it's all mythology, or it's all a lie of Satan that's trying to distract you from the truth. I mean, this is what people will tell you. And you have to decide, what am I going to believe here? Is this a, a redemption? Is Satan the Satan character that we have labeled in the serpent character in the garden, is this character really a character bringing a redemptive act or a freeing act from the gods? Is, is Jehovah or, or is Elohim, are they really the bad guys? Who has twisted this tale on its ear? To those writing the religious books that we are familiar with? Or is it the or is it the original stories that tell the stories in an almost opposite fashion? And of course, you're going to have those within the religions tell you, "Be careful! This is the stuff of Satan, and you have yeah, to watch out what yeah, you're doing." Exactly. The, the, the big problem I have with that is everybody will fall lock step into that. But how do you know which story is true when they all start to look alike? Um, 
I, I, I use an example in the book, and this just comes to mind. I hope I'm not rabbit trailing too much here, but I talk about the... Uh, no, we rabbit trail re- regularly here. That's kind of a methodology. <laughs> <laughs> rabbit holing as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, uh, I liken it to the, the grand old theaters around the turn of the uh, 19th to the 20th century, um, where you've got the big uh, golden... Uh, uh, proscenium arched theaters with the chandeliers hanging and all the gold and the sparkly and the, the velvet seats and they're all looking toward the stage and no matter wherever you sat in one of those seats you had a perspective of the stage um, if I sat in the orchestra pit I had one perspective if you sat right next to me you would see the almost identical thing but maybe an almost a slight almost indiscernible difference in perspective but we're looking at the same thing on stage. Uh, if you sit back in the audience, uh, uh, maybe even back behind a pillar where you have the partially obstructed view, um, it's a different perspective. If you're up in the balcony, you have a different perspective. But all of these perspectives represented by every single one of those chairs, they're all pointed toward the same stage watching the same play. The play does not change because my perspective is different. And uh, so here is the big question I have. With all these different perspectives, is it really a question of all ro- the all roads lead to Rome question? Is it really um, all of these religions are right and all of these religions are wrong and it all depends on what you choose and it's what you choose is the right thing? This starts to get beyond looking at mythology and asking if this mythology which is based in these religions is really something that is true or not true or something that should be listened to. It, it really starts to affect you on a level that's very different than just examining the story. Because if I look at this story and I have, and I am a man of faith or a person of faith, whether Jewish or whether Christian, we'll use those two primarily, and I start looking at these stories and saying, well, hey, wait a minute, the, the sources of my story these things I'm looking at anthropologically and archaeologically, if that's true the way I'm looking at it, that changes the whole meaning of what I say I believe. So the big question is, what story is true? And if Moses built Judaism, which is the basis for Christianity, all Christianity is is Judaism with the Messianic uh, factor fulfilled. Right, right. If if Moses built that faith off of other faiths or other religions, what does that do to that religion? Why is this an important question? It's because it gets to the very core of things. Uh, and you can dismiss it all, but it's like even the Bible says, now that you know, now what does the Bible say? Now that you know the truth, you are without excuse. And now that you've heard these things, you are without excuse. You know what it says. Now you have to deal with it. And that's the same thing with all of this. Now that we know these things, what are we going to do with it? How are we going to deal with what we know? And that's the big question that's underlying this whole thing and why I believe it's an important study. It's pulling my head up out of the, out of the hole in the ground, and it's looking at what's there and trying to discern what's there. And if... For me, if God exists, if my faith says God exists, if your faith says that, I can't controvert that. But what do you do when the facts controvert it? Is there something wrong with your facts or is there something wrong with your faith? And this stuff to me gets to the core. Now we haven't even hit on the whole, and I don't think it really matters, the whole uh, current day ancient alien, if you will, theory that um, that we are governed by a race of reptilians that came from another star system eons ago made us or genetically engineered us and are still controlling us from behind the scenes um, I don't know that that matters uh, I don't know if it's real all I can tell you is that there is no source point that gives me any fact that it is the truth any more than any of this other stuff but all this religious mythology is the source points for that alien mythology they all operate off of each other and they all are part of each other so which is true Uh, we don't know for sure is it all purely and simple God it's God 
and all these things are devils and demons and everything and angels and everything in between? Or did ancient man encounter, and I, I have to invoke uh, Philip Coppins here, a mm, friend of yeah. mine, uh, who is no longer with us, but he's, uh, we were talking about this very thing, and I said, uh, or, or is it that our understanding, which now this is not a new, a new thought to us now, but when I was a kid and first heard this, it was brand new, but what if ancient mankind in encountering these beings labeled them as gods, angels, devils, and demons, and everything in between, when in reality they were something else? And when I start hearing that Elohim is very possibly the chief of a cast of Elohim, uh, a pantheon of gods, that changes everything about what I once believed. And I have to ask myself, is that heresy on my part and blasphemy? <coughs> Or is there something to that? Why? There's my rabbit trail. <laughs> well, it is, but no, you just, you opened up a, a whole series of questions because our audience is composed of people who, for the most part, are not skeptics. And... I, I'm not saying there are a whole range of belief structures. There are what I call true believers who are just, frankly, starry-eyed, would believe anything people. There are people who have reasons to believe what they believe because it's rooted in their experience and their understanding. And you have skeptics, which I consider to be healthy. We went through this when Michael was on the show about you know what a skeptic really is and the purpose that a skeptic serves in the kind of conversation that we're having. Now, a cynic's another matter altogether. That's off yes. to the side. But we're, we're living in a time where we're seeing almost a complete return back to a cycle. That is, that there's this renewed interest. And, you know, you draw an imaginary date line. Okay, well, let's draw it at 1947. It's easy to see. It's within our historical grasp. So now we go... Post-1947, and we have UFO flaps, and we have these stories beginning to emerge out of the culture of contacts, abductions, um, all sorts of strange paranormal experiences that seem to stream back, beckoning to these ancient legends that we've been talking about. What do we do with this? How do we mold this into our modern understanding? Are we falling into the trap of the new age, or are we experiencing a gestalt of something that's beckoning back to ancient knowledge? Um... I missed. I missed the question. You're looking for what? Okay. You know, basically, what? what I'm saying is, are we in a period of time where we're seeing a revival of these ancient oh, oh. Myth, mythologies again yes. for a purpose? Um, you know, the purpose. There is the big question, isn't it? That's the big philosophical question, even at the core of religion. Purpose. What is my purpose? Why am I here? Uh, uh, why have I been put here? Uh, according to my Judeo-Christianity, I'm put here for the pleasure of God. Um, I am his to do with as he pleases. And <laughs> frankly, if God wants to wipe us all out, we're his. Uh, you know, it might be a fatalistic way of looking at it, but if God created us with free will and created mankind and we are all his, we're his, his creations, does he not have the right to do with us whatever he wants to? If he is the kind of God he is. If he's imbued us with freedom, then Christianity is wrong when it restricts that freedom if we choose to not believe in God. That would be our free exercise of our free will. So all of this stuff is stuff that the trappings we have built on top of it. So the big question really is, what's the purpose of us being here? Same thing the other way around. What, what is the purpose of our creation? If... Uh, uh, were we created to be a slave species to an alien race? Were we genetically bred up from, uh, as some of the cuneiform texts put it, the, the uh, uh, mankind was bred from the roving bands of wild hominids that were not organized and civilized humanity, uh, uh, that we were bred up from that? And for what purpose? To become a slave race to the Anunnaki? Then again, the Babylonians talk about uh, Barosis, or their fourth uh, century uh, magician, philosopher, Magi. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. He wrote down the story of Oanes, the, 
half fish, half man god that came up out of the Persian Gulf to the ancient uh, to the ancient peoples of Babylon, and uh, or of again the Sumerian culture, and uh, uh, that they came up he and his people from the sea, and every morning, and they would teach civilization to humanity, and they would go back to the sea at night until humanity got it. Uh, Laird Scranton wrote about the Dogon in West Africa. Absolutely. Who, yeah. who, who had talk of these star beings who came down, and the first thing they had to do was build a water tank so they could live. They were amphibian, uh, uh, aquatic in nature, but half, but part human, and they would teach human civilization from there. And so all of these stories smack of similar beginnings and similarities. So what do you do when they all start looking alike? Um, you say there's got to be a common source. And again, I may have drifted way off your question. No, no actually, the, the question really doesn't have an answer, but it was... Purpose, you asked about. Pur- about purpose, purpose, really, purpose. you know, it's like we seem to be in this period of time where we're kind of in this introspective mode about who we are relative to what's out there which in some ways is a product of the space age and the fact that man ventured off of the earth and also the fact that it appears as though based on what we can scrape together of what you would call proof or evidence that something from space has also been interacting with earth for a long time and we look for proof but what is proof? And I, and I, and I know this kind of goes to where your book leads, is what is proof? Is it, is it part of our, our, our consciousness, our experience? Is it something that demands rigid evidence, rigid data in order to prove? What, what at the end of the day really constitutes a, a strong case for or against this intervention in humanity? Um, are you are you asking if there's something that is, a, that, that is a strong proof against this intervention? No, either for or against it. In other oh, words, for or in, 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 in your in your work and in the people that you've interacted with, and I mean, you, you've mentioned Philip Coppins, and and, yeah. and I, I you know I interviewed Philip, and he was a diligent researcher who I believe kind of tilted on the side that yes, there was interaction with other other races other beings but that at the same time it seemed like he was still looking for the connective thread too uh, yeah i think he was and i i, I remember him saying the same thing to me um the, we talk about an interaction with non-human entities and this is where i started using the term paleo contact um as opposed to ancient aliens really the same thing it's just semantics but i wanted something that described it a little better and uh, so I, I don't know that I dubbed it, but I started using it, uh, paleo contact. Somewhere in our ancient past, we were contacted by something. And uh, um, be it God, uh, like I said, humans may have called something else God. They may have called God something else. And so I think there was, hmm, there was an intervention of some kind. Uh, on what level? I don't know. Uh, you know, you get done asking, did man have the ability and the ingenuity to build the pyramids without alien intervention? Hell yes. I think ancient man was intelligent. Uh, we had ingenuity. We knew how to stack stones and, and, and do math and make things work. I don't attribute uh, uh, ancient alien contact to all of these things, although there are some people that are smarter than me that have. Um, I just happen to think that, you know, I crawled up inside back in January. I was up inside the Great Pyramid, and I'm looking around. I'm looking at the stonework as we're going up on the inside, and I said to uh, Dr. Ward, I said, I'm convinced of one thing. I said, a bunch of guys built this, and number two, guys that were a lot better at math than me. And uh, and it's and it's very true. If you've got ten to 20,000 people, that that's all they have to do. There's no cell phones or TVs or lawns to mow or whatever in this whole society is dedicated to their pharaoh and uh they're the ones that are building these monuments and these treasure cities and things like this uh this is what they did they had the manpower to do it and they had some geniuses that were drawing up the plans on how to make it work um 
So all of that to say, were we influenced? There's a big question right there, isn't it? Um, here's the question in our current book on Moses and the Exodus, uh, the Exodus reality it's called. I'm looking at Moses as a man who, who grew up for the first 40 years in Egypt as a son of the palace. He was, uh, he was indeed a prince of Egypt. I believe the man, I know who Moses was. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, a man that was given the title of hereditary crown prince of Egypt. He was a vizier of Egypt. He was a royal architect of Egypt. He was somebody who had been in the military. He tutored the Pharaoh's daughter. And by the way, tutors back then weren't just school teachers. They were men who usually were very accomplished in military and in other deeds in their, their careers. And uh, this is the man who he was. And he was, while perhaps born Hebrew, he was thoroughly Egyptian when he left Egypt. And uh, 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 this is the man um, who, who brought most of what we know about the Old Testament to us. I also believe, though, that he's a man who knew nothing about Jehovah God until he had an experience. Because he went from Egypt to Midian, where it says he married the daughter of the pagan high priest, and he learned all the stories of the religions around him. Then all of a sudden, he has a spiritual experience um, think of your contactees nowadays mm -hmm. and the way people mm -hmm. look at them or people who have religious experiences. God, talk to me, Randy. God, talk to me. And uh, you're going to look at me and go, okay, you've got an interesting story. Let's do this interview. And off air, you're going to go, wow, this guy is a nutcase. <laughs> um, he thinks God talked to him. Well, this is Moses. And now this is, of course, in different times. But Moses was, remember, he wrote the story. He was the only one there. Nobody else saw it. And he talks it's about how God private revelation, a, basically, yes. A private revelation. And then he went on to do what he did. He went back to Egypt. Now, it, it's interesting that when, and I can't get into this because we don't have time to get into this in particular, but all these characters in Egypt, these Pharaonic characters, there was all a connection to this man. And I believe uh, uh, um, that... Uh, this is that story of epiphany. It's that story of learning something that we didn't know before and appropriating it and making it work. Did God really meet with Moses? Is there really intervention on a divine level? Were the plagues and the Red Sea parting and all of this in Moses' case, were these all divine acts? We don't know. We weren't there, and there's no record of them other than the Bible. And so that makes it a book of faith. And who wrote about them? Moses is the guy that recorded it all. And so we don't really know. And uh, we know the guy existed, but we don't know about the faith. And I think like Muhammad did a thousand years later, in the, you know, in, as, as he was trying to establish, uh, is, uh, he was trying to unify the Arabic tribes. And right, they worshiped right. 360 different gods in Mecca. And he had a Christian man and a Jewish man who were mentors of his who said, you cannot lead a people into unity without having yes. monotheistic religion. Yeah, political strategy. So what, did, so what did he do? He went back and eliminated 359 gods and raised Halad, uh, I'm sorry, Hadal to the, the, the position of chief god, one and only monotheistic god, and renamed him Allah. And said, this will be your god, and he unified the people. That. And Moses did the same thing. How much of that was real, godly, um, unearthly interaction, we don't know. And of course, it goes much farther spread than Christianity and Muslimism, or, or Islam uh, uh, and Judaism. It goes to every other culture has something like this. So the big question is who intervened and why were they here? And uh, it, it boils all down to these, some of, some of it boils down to the reptilian stories we have and that every culture out there has been affected by the serpentine, by the reptilian. You know, you, I actually think you close the loop beautifully with all of that. It gives us a place to go because we continue to look for proof and evidence, but at the same time, we have to understand that, that this is experiential and each one of us is kind of going through our own revelation as we go along. 
Scotty, uh, in the closing minutes here, um, again, let people know where they can find you, the websites and sure. uh, uh, the magazine and the conference and all of the things sure. that you're involved with. Um, my, uh, my magazine that I publish is Intrepid Magazine, and you can just simply go to intrepidmag.com, and that's our magazine site. And uh, we also put on the Paradigm Symposium. Uh, we have tickets for sale uh, on that now. It's not until October, but we have a phenomenal lineup of people from Scott Walter from uh, H2 History Channel, uh, America Unearthed, to Giorgio Sukulis, to Robert Schock, uh, to John Ward, who's writing this book with me, uh, Robert Boval, uh, Kathleen McGowan Coppins, uh, and several other names that you're going to recognize are, uh, are in attendance speaking at this event in October. So come and get your tickets now and uh, take a look. And when you go to Intrepid Mag, if I can put in a very shameless plug, go for it. We're in the midst. We're in the midst of expanding our efforts. We're a two-man show here, been in existence for two years as of this month, and we're trying to expand into areas that, sad to say, it always takes money to expand. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, rather than go those conventional routes where the bank will either say no or own you and the same with an investor. Uh, we put up a uh, uh, Indiegogo site, which is uh, simply a crowdsource funding, uh, where you can go in and if you like what you see about us, uh, you see, you can take a look at the Indiegogo page. If you like what you see, feel free to uh, come on in and be a part of what we do. And there's a widget on the right-hand column of our Intrepid Mag site, where uh, if you're interested, click on that from the Indiegogo page, take a look. And other than that, uh, me personally, you can find all my stuff at my personal website, scottellenroberts.com. And uh, two T's on Scott, one L, so it's A-L-A-N, and Allen, so scottellenroberts.com. And links will go up with the podcast of this show as well. Scott, hang on the line for a minute. I'll catch you on the other side. All right. Uh, coming up next week, again, paranormal espionage with UK paranormal investigator Tony Topping. Two weeks, May 1st, Chris Carter is going to join us for two hours. We're going to talk about science and the near-death experience. Many other shows coming up as we continue through the month of May. You want to check the websites at offplanetradio.com and offplanetradio.net. I'm Randy Moggins. This is Off Planet Radio. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Keep looking for it. We'll see you again next week.